Good morning, church family, and all those who are joining us online. I bring you greetings from Drayton Mills Church of Christ. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know that we have been doing a sermon series uh, entitled Blessed, a study through um, the Beatitudes. Here we are. We are in week four. So if you don't mind, meet me in the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, we will be reading um, verse number six in which Jesus says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Once again, uh, Jesus says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Beloved, after a meal, our gastrointestinal tract slowly empties by pushing food through our stomach and small and large intestines. This is accomplished through the use of specialized uh, contractions called the migrating motor complex or MMC. And it usually is a process that takes about two hours or 130 minutes to complete. And the final stage of MMC is to produce controlled contractions that cause our stomach uh, to contract in such a way to produce hunger pain. So if you notice um, that you start to feel your stomach growling or rumbling, essentially that is your body letting you know that your stomach no longer has food in it. So following MMC, beloved, the hormone ghrelin, it activates some neurons in our hypothalamus region of the brain, which gives us these signals to let us know and feel hunger. So essentially two hours after we've eaten, our brains pick up messages from our stomach that tell us it's time for our next meal. And we'll continue to receive more and more signals the longer we continue on what's called homeostatic hunger. Beloved, in other words, hunger essentially, when it boils down to is that it is a sign that our stomach is empty. Hunger is, 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 is a message being sent to let us know that we are in need of something. Hunger is a sign of absence. It's, it's a sign that something has not in or something needs to be satisfied within us, beloved. Hunger is also a sign when you boil down the science of it and its pathways is a sign of health. To be hungry means that your body is desiring something that's going to benefit you. To be hungry means that your body is telling you that you need something that's going to make you stronger. To be hungry means that your body is telling you that you as presently constituted is not enough to grow. And finally, beloved, uh, to be hungry means essentially that you're alive. Hunger is a universal experience for everyone that is alive. The child in utero knows hunger. The toddler knows hunger. The teenager knows hunger. The adult knows hunger. Grandma and grandpa know hunger. Beloved, nobody had to teach you what it is to be hungry. Nobody had to teach you how to be hungry. You didn't learn uh, the ways in which you should be hungry. No, hunger is the proof positive affirmation that you are alive. And the only people who do not experience hunger are the dead and the dying. And beloved, if you can understand that complete picture of what it is and the significance of homeostatic hunger, then you should be able to understand what Jesus is trying to get across to his audience when he stands on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee and says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness because those who hunger understand that there is a void and those that hunger understand that there is an emptiness here. Those that hunger understand that they need something outside of themselves to grow, beloved, because ultimately those that hunger for righteousness are those that are spiritually alive. Beloved, to be able to uncover the full weightiness of what Jesus is teaching in the Beatitudes is essential that we don't lose the context or, or the premeditation of what Jesus is trying to accomplish. Matthew chapter 5 essentially opens up with the statement, and seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and sat down. And beloved, I highlight that because what Matthew is trying to make sure that we understand is that the magnitude of the gathering, it's, it's not just a single large crowd. No, Matthew is saying that this is multiple crowds 
coming from multiple Jewish territories, all converging upon Jesus, who was standing there on the shore of Galilee. And Jesus knows exactly why they are there. Jesus knows what they are expecting. Jesus knows what they are anticipating for him to say. Jesus knows that he could easily get every single one of them on his side. He knows what he could say to have all of them singing his praises. Jesus knows that he can simply throw something out there and all of them will go back home and be singing his praises and lifting up his name all through Palestine. But that's not what we get from Jesus. Jesus does not affirm their expectations. Jesus does not speak to their itching ears. Jesus is not concerned with what they think about him, what they say about him, how they lift him up. Instead, Jesus systematically dissects everything that they think that they are and everything that they think that they know. And beloved, in case you missed it, in case you missed it, I want you to understand that the Beatitudes not only dissected those folk standing on the shore of Galilee, but the Beatitudes dissect us this morning, all of us who are listening, because these same words that challenge them are the same words that challenge who we think we are and the same words that challenge what they thought they knew are the same words that challenge what we think we know so beloved if you show up to God somehow believing that God owes you something because of who you are then these words are specifically for you if you show up thinking that somehow your blessedness is connected to the church that you are associated with, then, beloved, these words are specifically for you. And if you show up on Sunday mornings thinking that somehow because I checked out five boxes for five acts of worship and that is where your blessedness comes from, beloved, these beatitudes should serve as a wake-up call, serve as an alarm, serve as a reminder to the super saints that they are not the ones who are blessed. The ones who are blessed are the ones who are poor in spirit. Who are those? Those are the ones that know that they know that they know that they know that there is nothing about me that is worthy to be blessed. These Beatitudes, beloved, are a reminder that blessed are those that mourn, those that never let go of the fact that on my own, I ruined me and I ruined everyone around me. Beloved, these Beatitudes are a reminder that blessed are the meek, those that understand that God does not owe me anything because I am as low as low comes and I hope you are seeing this picture and I hope that these beatitudes are challenging you because Jesus takes it a step further when he says blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied beloved notice Jesus is continuing his dissection of self-righteousness that is the first teachings that Matthew records. This is what Jesus wants to emphasize first, his dissection of self-righteousness. He starts off by starting off by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, but now he's pressing upon them. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, which implies and presupposes that these persons who hunger and thirst for righteousness do so because they are not already righteous. You cannot yearn for something that you already are in possession of. Rather, you only hunger for that which you do not have possession of. And so, beloved, before we unpack what Jesus means when he says hunger and thirst for righteousness, I need us to have at least a, a general or proper, under, uh, proper theology for righteousness. A quick etymological study will reveal that righteousness comes from this word dikaya which comes from the root dikaios, which means correct or right. Beloved, so from that root, uh, when we talk about righteous or righteousness, we are talking about being right, being correct. The question is, being right or correct according to what? According to God's standard set out by the law. Beloved, so being right in the manner that God requires one to be right. So righteousness to the core, beloved, uh, is the idea of being right according to God's standards. But biblically, what we see and what we find is that righteousness is utilized of, in two different ways. There is legal righteousness and then there is moral righteousness. Beloved, when we talk about legal righteousness, we're talking about imputed righteousness. We're talking about the, 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 the fact that you could not live up to God's standard of right, rightness and correctness according to the law he gave, and you are legally guilty. Jesus, on the other hand, was able to do what you could not do 
and earn a righteousness that you could not earn according to God's law and God's standards. So Jesus is legally innocent. But what makes the gospel so good is that God takes Jesus's in righteousness and imputes it on your account. In other words, God takes the righteousness that Jesus earned and he puts it on you. And then you are regarded as legally innocent. Beloved, it is a righteousness that we could not get from our own works, but it was counted on our behalf because of our faith in Jesus. Matter of fact, you read about this, this concept of imputed righteousness in Romans chapter four, and it says, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies who? The ungodly, his faith is counted as righteous. So when we talk about imputed righteousness, the person is ungodly, but counted as righteous because righteousness came from somebody else, somewhere else. And so beloved, you flip over one more chapter to chapter five of verse of, of Romans, it says by one man's obedience, many will be counted or made righteous. So beloved, that's, that's imputed righteousness. That's legal righteousness. The second way that we find righteousness being utilized in the Bible is not legal righteousness, but moral righteousness. And that's what we call not imputed righteousness, but imparted righteousness. And this is a righteousness that every child of God is called to strive for. And it is it, it, used to describe the process of sanctification by which God is, is transforming us into his image. So, beloved, if you flip over one more chapter into chapter 6 of verse Roman of, of Romans, after Paul has already established legal righteousness in chapters 4 and 5, uh, he believes because of what Jesus did for us, because of, of, of the grace that was shown to us, we are not to continue into sin, but we are to be so moved by that grace and that imputed righteousness that we do our best to live up to the righteousness. So in chapter six, he says, uh, do not present yourself as members of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God being made alive from dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. So on the one hand, there is this righteousness that is solely the work of Jesus. And then there is this righteousness that God has called us to pursue every day. It's a righteousness that calls us to desire to be better every day, to live better, to strive towards holiness, to conform and transform into the image of God. It is a practical righteousness that moves us down the road of sanctification. And beloved, it is this imparted righteousness that Jesus has on the forefront of his mind when he says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. So let's put this together. When Jesus says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, righteousness, the verbs hunger and thirst give the picture of extreme need. It, it, it's a neediness. It's, 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 it's a desperation. And beloved, I fear that many of us cannot truly grasp the magnitude of what Jesus is saying because we live in the United States of America. We live in, in, in a situation and in a country where we don't really know what hunger is. We don't really experience hunger. We may know what it is to be hungry, but we don't know what it is to hunger after something. Because we live in a world, we can easily go pop something in the microwave. We can easily throw something in the air fryer. We can easily walk over, open the fridge, pull something out, get something to drink. We can easily tear open a bag of chips, stop at a gas station, pull in the Chick-fil-A, pull in the McDonald's. We don't know what it is to truly hunger and to truly thirst for something. But Jesus is talking to people who knew what hunger was. They knew what thirst was. They didn't have a refrigerator. They didn't have fast food restaurants. They didn't have a pantry that was full of imperishable items. No, beloved, these people worked every day for one purpose, and that one purpose is so that they could eat. Meaning that if you went a couple days where you could not find work or you didn't work, then you went a couple days in which you did not eat. Matter of fact, when you look through the New Testament, oftentimes when it talks about food or purchasing food, it often speaks about food and measures food by the daily wage. So, beloved, he's talking to people who have traveled from near and far 
some for days and for weeks to get there and they understand what hunger is and what thirst is. So at its core, hunger is a sign that you have a need, a desperation there. Hunger is a sign that something is missing. Hunger is a sign that my current status is inadequate and I need something outside of myself, inside of myself to strengthen myself and to grow myself. So when Jesus says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, he is saying, blessed are those that have a desire to be better. Blessed are those that are not satisfied with who they are. Blessed are those that realize they need something because they are inadequate. Blessed are those that want to be transformed. Blessed are those that want to be more like God, more like Jesus. Blessed are those who know that they can simply be better, a better Christian, a better husband, a better mother, a better friend, a better wife, beloved. Blessed are those that need that know that they need to be more than what they are right now. They know they need to be more loving, more patient, more faithful, more trusting. Blessed are those who just simply desire and crave more of God, more knowledge of him, more time with him, more worship towards him, more of his presence. Beloved, beloved, uh, 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 those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that is a sign that you are spiritually alive because if you show me a christian that no longer craves to be transformed i'll show you a christian whose spirit is dead you show me a christian who was numb to their own faults and shortcomings i will show you a christian who is spiritually dead beloved i don't care how long you have walked with god if you show me a christian that does not want to be better than they were yesterday i will show you a christian that is spiritually dead because all you got to do is read your bible and you'll come across a man by the name of david david was the king of israel david was hand chosen by God. David was anointed by God. David received direct revelation from God. David was promised an everlasting throne from God. But despite everything that David was and despite everything God had given him and despite the fact of how present God was in David's life, David still wrote, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you and my flesh Thanks for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Beloved, just keep reading and you'll come across a man by the name of Paul. Paul was hand chosen by Jesus. Paul was given direct revelation by Jesus. Paul was empowered by the spirit of Jesus. Paul was protected by Jesus and for as many years as Paul spent in the fellowship of Jesus and for as many years as Paul spent in the ministry of Jesus, Paul still want wrote that I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Wait a minute, Paul. Don't you know Christ? Yes, I know him, but I want more of him. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But the question that you need to ask yourself is do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do you still have that passion to be better? Do you still have that longing to know God more? Or is your Christian witness, is it something that you have become indifferent to? Are you somebody that gave your life to Jesus decades ago and simply have, been, uh, simply have become apathetic to the things of God, apathetic to the effect of sin on your life, the effect of sin around you? Beloved, I... I or are you somebody who is even more dedicated now to give yourself so completely to God that he can use you in ways that you never imagined? Notice what Jesus says when he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. It's almost a paradox there because the blessing comes in hungering and thirsting for righteousness. But then he says, you shall be satisfied. And the paradox is, when you're satisfied, it means that you no longer 
hunger and thirst for righteousness. But I want you to kind of understand what he means when he says you shall be satisfied. It comes from a Greek word which sent, uh, essentially means to be filled. It's the ideal, the word picture of something being submerged and saturated in a liquid to be filled that way. It's almost the idea of a sponge. You take a sponge, you submerge it into a bucket of water. No matter how much you squeeze that sponge, uh, it stays saturated. You can still continue to use it, and the more you squeeze it, the more it continues to fill itself up and, and, to, and to be saturated. And beloved, that's the blessing of hungering and thirsting after God. That when you do that, God saturates you with his presence. The more you hunger and thirst for God, he saturates you with his spirit. He will transform you. And it works like this. The more you ex want God, the more you experience God. The more you experience God, the more you want God. The more you know of God, the more you want to know of God. The more you want to know of God, uh, uh, the more you learn of God, the more you want to know of God. And so, beloved, the question you should be asking yourself is, do I hunger and thirst for righteousness? Some of you may be asking yourself, how, how do I know that I hunger and thirst for righteousness? And beloved, essentially, it's, it's the same way that you know that you hunger and thirst for food. When you're hungry, food is constantly on your mind. When you're thirsty, quenching that thirst is constantly on your mind. You're not really hungry if I sit down and hand you a pizza and you don't want to eat. You're not really hungry or thirsty if you want to go outside and run a marathon. But beloved, when it's constantly on your mind, when you're truly hungry, you'll do whatever it takes to find some food. You'll stop everything. Everything loses priority. The stuff you have to do, the places you have to be, you are going to find food. If you're truly thirsty, you're not going to go and do this or do that. Quenching that thirst is going to be at the forefront of your mind. Well, beloved, I want you to apply that spiritually, that when you truly hunger and thirst for God, it is constantly on your mind. You're constantly trying to put yourself in position to be better and to be stronger. Beloved, I hope that that challenges you. I pray that this sermon series and these Beatitudes give us a reality check as we look in the mirror and see who it is that are truly blessed by God, who it is that these people who are makarios, these people who are cherished and lifted up by God. If you don't mind, uh, please join me in, in, in prayer. But before we do that, if there's somebody out there who's not a child of God, we want you to be saved. We want you to understand the beauty of the gospel message. We talked about it when we talked about imputed righteousness. You are not good enough by yourself to make it to heaven, but the good news is Jesus was. He came, he lived perfectly because you could not, and because of that, you have an opportunity to be saved. All we have to do is put your faith in Jesus, that he came, did what he said he did, and he is who he said he was. If you can put your faith in Jesus, that he can be your savior, you can be saved today. Simply make the decision, now I'm ready to just follow him. He's my savior. I'm going to follow him all the way to glory. If you're there, you are a fit candidate to be saved. Reach out to us at DraytonMillsCoc uh, at Yahoo.com or DraytonMillsCoc.org. We will contact you and we'll simply ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If your answer is yes, we'll baptize you for the remission of your sins and you will be a child of God Almighty. But if you don't mind, let us go together before the throne of God. Dabney, most gracious Father, we come before you this morning just giving thanks and honor and glory for you being God. Father, we're just thankful that it's you who sits on the throne. We're thankful that it's you, Father, that holds our life uh, in your hands. Father, we are just so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for what he accomplished for us. Father, we're thankful for imputed righteousness. Dear Lord, we just pray that these messages continue to challenge us, that these messages continue to remind us of who we are, Father, in light of who you are. Father, we hope that these messages push us closer to you, Father, and relight um, our zeal and our hunger and our desire for righteousness. Father, if you can just help us to get to that point, Father, that is more than enough. And all these things we ask in the name of your most precious and holy son, Jesus Christ, let everybody say amen. May God bless you. May God keep you. And prayerfully, we'll see you right here next week. Let it rise.
Let the Spirit of the Lord let it rise among us. Oh, let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Oh, let the praises of our King rise among us. Oh, let it rise. As we do so, join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, where it reads, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you to do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink, of the, drink from the cup. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you right now for the sacrifice of your son a sacrifice that renews us and allows us to be, give, for be forgiven from our sins. We remember the portrayal, Father God, of your son. We remember the arrest. We remember the torture, Father God. And we remember the cruel cross, dear Lord. Remembering his body as we take the bread and shed blood as we take the cup, Father God, doing so in the manner that has been prescribed by your word, Father. Offering this prayer through your loving son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, it is time for us to give back a portion of what the Lord has blessed us with. And it tells us how to give in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and following. And it states, Let us give as we purpose in our heart, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us not give grudgingly, not out of necessity. So at this time, let us bless the giving. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you again for blessing us with uh, uh, means that you have for us to provide for ourselves and uh, give back to you a portion of what is already yours. Asking and praying for those who uh, may want to give but simply don't have, that you would bless them in a special way that they may have to give at the next appointed time. And we ask that these 
uh, funds that we are, are offering, that we're giving, that uh, they may be used in a way that's pleasing me in your sight, and that you continue to uh, help us to be a good stewardess over the things that you have entrusted into our hands. Again, we thank you for all things, but we thank you most of all for your son, Christ, uh, who have made it all possible. And it is in his precious name we ask and we pray these prayers. Let us all say, Amen. Good morning. Now is the time that we will uh, do our closing prayer. Uh, so please take a minute and bow with me. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for every day that you give us. We thank you so much for the, your son who died upon the cross for us. We will thank you for all the blessings you continue to give us. We ask this time to be with those who are sick and bereaved. We ask that you be with our members so that they stay steadfast in your, their love for you. We pray that everyone continues to study your word to show that self approved. We ask that you continue to be with our congregation as we uh, worship during this pandemic area. And we ask that we can one day get back together real soon to worship in truth and spirit. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.